Good morning. The Ad Hoc Committee on Gang Violence and Youth Development will now come to order. If you wish to make a uh, comment to this committee, you can fill out a public comment card at the back of the room and give it to the clerk to my left. If you feel compelled to have a private conversation, please do not go behind this wall. We can hear you better from back there. Uh, you can exit the double doors and uh, have your conversation without disturbing the committee or uh, the people who are here to hear the committee. So with that, we will take the items in order that they appear on the agenda. We'll begin with item number one. Item number one, Chief Legislative Analyst report in response to motion, Cardinus Perry relative to instructing the CLA with the assistant of appropriate city departments to report on the status of consolidating the city's gang programs within the office of the mayor and a proposed request for qualifications for gang intervention services and gang reduction and youth development zones and citywide in general. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Felipe Chavez with the CLA's office. On May 22, 2008, the Ad Hoc Committee on G Gang Violence and Youth Development considered a motion, Cardenas Perry instructing our office to prepare a draft scope of work and evaluation criteria for request for qualifications for the provision of gang intervention services in the city's 12 gang reduction and youth development zones. The recommended scope of work anticipates a process that combines a request for qualifications and request for proposals in that Proposers would be considered according to specific qualification requirements before consideration of full proposals. This would alleviate the need to, uh, for two separate procurement processes. In preparing this draft scope of work, we researched RFPs and RFQs issued in the past. Uh, the scope of work is consistent with the community-based gang intervention model, and as requested by your committee, we considered and included comments provided by the general public. The scope of work lays out the expected type and level of gang intervention services that are to be provided in each designated gang reduction zone. In addition to such services, contractors would be required to collect data to assess the effectiveness of the city's overall intervention program. We also developed uh, general scoring criteria, which is divided into three major categories, experience, administrative capacity, and ser service delivery. Uh, based on priorities communicated by the community, community and the committee, greater emphasis is placed on experience over the other two categories. Okay. All right. Um, when it comes to the report, um, is this the, the, the kind of process that was used before when it came to uh, contracting intervention or prevention work with the city? Well, I, I believe this, is a, this process is a little different right? because we actually went through a process we, where we solicited or we, we had an opportunity for the public to provide their input as well. And this process is also different because it incorporates the request for qualifications as well as the request for proposals. So in the past, did they do an RFQ or an RFP process? RFP. RFP. What's the, what's the basic, uh, there are many differences, but what are one, one of the fundamental basic differences between an RFQ process and an RFP process? The RFQ process actually um, requires that the proposal, pr proposers meet certain um, qualifying criteria. Okay, and an RFP? Go ahead. Excuse me, Meg Barkley with sure. the CLA's office. Typically, it's my understanding that an RFQ is imposed to identify a pre-qualified list of qualified providers for services that can then be identified on an as-needed basis when a more lengthy procurement wouldn't really meet the needs of the city. An RFP process does also, I would, I would think, require pro proposers to meet certain qualifications. However, they also submit a lengthy proposal in as a part of that to meet specific services that are being requested by the city. The, I believe that the intent of the request for an RFQ by the committee was to get over the, the qualifying threshold to ensure that only agencies that 
met certain qualifications, demonstrated the ability to provide intervention services to the city, were then considered for those contracts. And we feel that the sort of combined model that's being proposed in our report meets both of those things in a, in a more timely manner than going through two procurement processes between the RF queue to identify the set of qualified providers and then doing a separate process within that list to allow proposers to submit proposals, but only from that list rather than a wide solicitation. Okay. Are RFQ, are RFQ processes and RFP processes both used by government when it comes to contracting? Yes. Yes. They are both used. So they are commonplace in, in, in Los Angeles and the county and the state and the country? Yes. Okay. So are there legal responsibilities and requirements whenever government uh, um, actually awards a contract? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that was a general question, and the general answer <laughs> is yes. Yes. Um, the reason why I ask you that question is because I think it's very important for people to understand that as we speak on the record and start to identify the potential for having an RFQ and RFP process for intervention contracts with the City of Los Angeles, is that we are being mindful of our fiduciary responsibilities, our legal responsibilities when it comes to uh, putting these contracts out in the future. We have provided contracts in the past. Uh, the closest I could describe as a, an intervention contract would be Bridges 2. But then again, when we were giving Bridges 1 and Bridges 2 contracts before, we never had an intervention definition. Uh, there were generic understandings, there were generic ideas and ideals as to what intervention work is or who an intervention constituent or who a constituent is that would per perhaps need intervention uh, support services or services within the city of Los Angeles. So what's unique about uh, the, the front end of this process, we actually have defined on behalf of the city and adopted an actual intervention model. And in that model we describe what kinds of activities are in fact considered intervention and what kinds of services are rendered in the realm of intervention and who those constituents are. And then in addition to that actually broke it down within prong one and prong two intervention services and in addition to that actually used terminology that was never used before in the city of Los Angeles or from my understanding never formally used anywhere in the country and that is that um, things like uh, the license to operate on the streets. I was sitting down uh, just the other day with um, someone who uh, um, seems to describe his operation which is a very very uh, good operation that actually provides prong two services when it comes to intervention, but actually was criticizing whether or not prong one even makes any sense. And my question to that person was, well, maybe the big difference is that you sit here in your office and you do great work and you have to wait for somebody to walk in the door and so you provide prong two services, you know, tattoo removal, job placements, things of that nature, maybe even counseling or what have you, but you don't make house calls. And he said, well, well, what do you mean? I don't make calls. I said, well, you sit here and you wait to, till people come of the mindset to actually walk through the door and they come to the realization that they need these services. They no longer want to be involved in gang activity or be a gang member, et cetera, that they've come to the point where they say, I want to provide for my family. I want a job. I want to provide for my family and therefore I realize that I can't get a job because I got a tattoo on my neck maybe removing that too will help people see beyond the surface and realize that I, I am a potential employee of theirs and then I can provide for my family. That's an example of the prong two services that are provided. But when it comes to prong one services, the prong one services, one example is when somebody actually is trying to uh, curtail any retaliation. Uh, perhaps there was a shooting on a Saturday night at one o'clock in the morning. It's uh, a pretty good logical uh, assessment or conclusion that there's some angry people who are angry about the fact that someone that they love and care about, whether it be a family member, whether it be a friend, whether it be a fellow gang member or what have you, um, that they've been violated to the point where they were killed just an hour ago. And there's, there's a good, it's probably a good, I, good assessment that there's probably some people angry enough that they may want to retaliate and perhaps take someone else's life. And that's where an example of a prong one service is where you have people who are out in the community and have enough credibility to go ahead and confront those individuals and convince them not to retaliate. 
And as a matter of fact, in, in recent months, uh, on the record at this committee, we have actually had police officers, not just street officers, but actually assistant chiefs of LAPD that have actually stated over and over and over again, without those prong one services, there would be much more bloodshed on our streets. There would be many more shootings and killings on our street. And prong one services are essential. And they've actually encouraged the policymakers as, of, as the city council to go ahead and uh, provide more uh, resources so we can have more prong one and prong two intervention services within the city. Uh, the reason why I um, am putting that back on the record in this committee hearing is because it's important for people to understand that we didn't just ask the CLA's office to provide uh, documentation and recommendations on how we would go about to have an RFQ and RFP process for intervention services. I want to make sure that people understand that this is precedent setting, this is something new, this is something very different, and uh, uh, I have no reason to criticize uh, the methods that we used in the past. The only people that should be criticized for us not doing this 10 years ago or 15 years ago is the lack of policy, the, the lack of drive of policymakers to actually uh, sit, listen, and understand what is going on out on the streets and understand that we cannot and never will be able to do the job of reducing the violence on the streets of our city purely through law enforcement. We need to do it through prevention, intervention, and now finally the state of California has been enlightened enough to start embarking on the, the efforts of reentry programs. Uh, we need to do that with that. And in addition to that, law enforcement will always be a component. Unfortunately, in this city, we have a ratio of, of, uh, of resources poured into the police department in excess of $1.4 billion annually now. And the resources for intervention up until this year have only been approximately $3.5 million. This year, we're now in excess of $6 million. And it is in my, my opinion that we are going to find out and realize, and we will document that through the, uh, through the efforts of the City Council, the fact that we need to grow those resources for intervention beyond the 10 million bar mark, beyond the 20 million mark, and hopefully we'll get to the point where someday we have the proper semblance of resources for intervention. And therein lies the reason for us to have an RFQ and an RFP process so we can make our efforts as accurate and as well thought out and as, uh, as uh, consolidated as possible and to make sure that we are using every dollar as efficiently as, and as effectively as possible. Um, now, uh, is, is there anywhere in the, this, this document that speaks to uh, contractors that may have to demonstrate their ability to uh, provide services beyond just in the uh, uh, English language? Yes. Why um, is that? Uh, paragraph 10, under the scope of work, uh, it states, contractor and staff must provide culturally sensitive gang intervention services to gang-involved youth and their families in Spanish or any other language as necessary. Okay. Um, uh, it's been documented that there is violence on the streets of Los Angeles to the point of actually um, uh, homicide violence uh, that is being committed or has been committed uh, by people who primarily speak Russian, by people who primarily speak Spanish, by people who primarily speak English, by people who primarily speak, I think Hmong is another language, uh, by people who are, um, tend to have their, their uh, their communication uh, in other than English. So uh, I agree that, that that is something that the city needs to start to recognize. And it's not about being biased or saying you're in America, you must speak English. The fact of the matter is uh, that's going to do no good when we know that the, the scene on the street was an act of violence to the point of homicide. And uh, the, the intelligence that we have says that perhaps it was uh, uh, um, um, it might have been in North Hollywood in the San Fernando Valley, and this it looks like something that has traces of uh, some kind of activity in and around uh, some of the Russian uh, groups out there or what have you. There's a uh, Russian immigrant enclave out there. So the fact of the matter is where uh, now that we recognize that, 
we have to put that into our understanding of how can we assemble the services necessary for us to reduce the violence effectively instead of just saying, well, they don't speak English, so that's not our problem, that's their problem. No, it is our problem. If we're going to, if we're going to stem the, uh, the violence, if we're going to attack this situation, if we're going to curtail it, then we're going to have to communicate in other languages if necessary. Um, uh. Now, in, in uh, your document, does it refer in any way to uh, potential contractors having to attend either policy meetings or, or demonstrating their understanding of uh, what, uh, what, uh, what the, the processes are within the city? Yes. Um, one of our, I believe it's paragraph 13, also under the scope of work, does require contractors to attend city council meetings, um, uh, meetings with council offices, and neighborhood councils as well. Okay. So and that that's mainly for, for the purposes of cross pollinating understandings? Understanding and familiarizing themselves with the city's process. Okay. And does that, any of that have to do with uh, increasing the communication for efforts of effectiveness? Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. Um, okay. When it comes to the gang intervention model, uh, it speaks to the issue of servicing gang-involved youth. How would we go ahead and do that to verify that an actual organization is serving gang-involved youth? Because one of the biggest problems that we've had in this country is the biggest contracts, in my opinion, that have been let out by government have uh, allowed organizations to uh, exclude uh, servicing those individuals. It would be, I would imagine that that would be something that would be included in the contractor's response to the qualification requirements as far as what population they serve, the level of success that they've had with serving that population, and upon reviewing those requirements as a threshold to reviewing their full proposal, the reviewer could, that would be a criteria for ensuring that this contractor is comfortable and has experience providing services to that population. But at the same time, it's one thing for a contractor, potential contractor or a contractor to actually articulate that they understand what needs to be done and that these constituents need to be served. But it's another thing for us as the government to actually put into writing and in the contract how to hold them accountable yes. so that they do not turn away those constituents and we technically have uh, allowed them to violate our intent, yet at the same time they're not violating the contract. Yes, I see what Correct? you're saying. They because that, that is what has happened in the past, not only with the city of Los Angeles, but throughout the country. We have allowed organizations to say that they are going to serve certain populations, that they're going to serve certain communities, and within that it's inherent that there are gang members out there, that there are gang-involved youth, yet at the same time we have not had measurements and or communication about how they are in fact serving them, or how many of them they have served, and what, they, what activities they're engaging, and so that they can actually prove that they've been serving those, that population. Because uh, one of the reasons why organizations don't like to serve that population, let's say it's an organization that actually has uh, meetings uh, out at, say they're fortunate to have their own facility, and they have uh, computer rooms, and they have, uh, they're doing homework with kids, and they maybe even have a basketball, playing basketball in the gym or what have you. Say they have a population at any given time, 70, 80, 150 youth, or young people from the community in a safe place and they're providing services. There's no question they're providing services. But then again, somebody walks onto that campus and they're dressed a certain way, they look very tough, and matter of fact, everybody knows and the murmurs start going around the room, well, there's, there's a smiley from the XYZ gang. And then all of a sudden, one of the directors goes up to smiley and says, how you doing, man? And he says, all right. And he says, you know what, smiley? You gotta go somewhere else. You're disrupting our services and they turn that person away. We've never had measurements in the city of Los Angeles or requirements to ask that question of organizations so that they can actually prove to us that they are not turning those individuals away. And if they are going to turn those individuals away, they don't turn them back out into the street, they actually provide services and refer them and make sure that they are connecting with those services. Mm -hmm. Yes. Councilman. Um, the scope of work is designed to, to target specifically gang-involved youth. 
but also because this is a draft document, we can take it back and include measures that require contractors to come back and report uh, on who their population and what their population is that they're serving. Thank you very much. Did you, did you work on this document? Yes, I did. Good. I want to acknowledge and thank you very much for acknowledging before the public and the people in this room that this is not a perfect document. This document is a work in progress, and it certainly is. We are continuing to take information from the public. As you, we have public testimony today, we're going to continue to incorporate anything and everything that is valuable for us to make the best document that we can. In addition to that, I anticipate that in future contracts we will have the opportunity to create enough fluidity and respect for the contractor so that as we learn as a city and as they learn, we grow together and we tighten up those contracts to the point where they are much more effective and much more efficient in holding the contractor accountable, yet at the same time, ultimately, the accountability needs to come to the City of Los Angeles because with or without these contractors, these contractors have not been sworn to office, they have not, they're not sworn officers. They have not been required to uphold the Constitution of the United States of the State of California, the, the, uh, the uh, Charter of the City of Los Angeles. It is us policymakers who have done that. It is our police officers who have done that. Our police chief, police chief has done that. The mayor of the City of Los Angeles has done that. All of us as, as representatives and sworn into office, sworn into our positions, have the ultimate responsibility. And with that ultimate responsibility comes the accountability to us to make sure that we do the best job that we can, that we do not just put something out on the street and say, our job is done. Our job is very fluid. And for the first time, I'm committing on the record that the City Council is required to keep that fluidity. The City Council is required to make sure that we continue to, to learn and to grow and to create a system of correspondence and a system of service when it comes to intervention and prevention within the city like never before. So thank you very much for acknowledging that there are shortcomings in this document. Not that this document was expected to be the end all or be all today. This document is not done. And with that, once we forward this document to the mayor's office, they have now been charged with handling prevention and intervention. They are the one stop place. They are the end all or be all. They are the place where, where answers, where the buck stops. And we are going to be working with them to make sure that we implement as much as we can of all that is good in this document and the testimony here in this committee to make sure that we have something that is much more appropriate for the service of, of the people of Los Angeles. Thank you. Um, now when it comes to prong one and prong two services uh, of intervention, um, how, can, how can we or, or does, does this document uh, attempt to address the fact that, that we need to make sure that they are integrated? Yes. Um, we actually took uh, the model and included it in as one of the bullets in the, under the scope of work. So it includes every aspect of the prong one, the prong two, and the shared prong one and prong two services. Okay. All right. And again, that, that needs to be in the, the documents and the agreements of contracts with the third party providers. Right. It doesn't, it can't just be a verbal understanding. It can't just be an understanding that in an, the interview process they actually uh, uh, conveyed to the city of Los Angeles that they understand that. They have to, we have to compel them by the, by the, in the form of a contract that they will in fact adhere to those standards. They will in fact adhere to those uh, requirements when they do the service on the streets. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, is there any public comment cards on this item? No public comment cards have been submitted. Okay. We are on item number one. Uh, the item has to do with the uh, Chief Legislative Analyst Office uh, report on an RFQ, RFP process for intervention contracts within the City of Los Angeles. Um, I'm speaking very slowly because uh, I see a lot of people who do intervention work within the City of Los Angeles, uh, whether they're contracted with the city or not, and I do not see any public comment cards. Now is the time to speak. Is there anything you've heard today in this committee? Is there anything that you understand about this document that you'd like to address or speak to? Uh, now is your opportunity to do so. Any cards for item one? Two cards? Okay, we have Carlos Rodriguez and Bill Martinez. Please come forward.
Thank you very much. Please identify yourself for the record. You have two minutes to make your comments. My name is Carlos. And if I ask you any questions, those, that's on my dime. That's my time. Thank okay, you. Go ahead. My name is Carlos Rodriguez. I'm the Vice President of Programs and Finance for Communities and Schools. Uh, the only comment I have with regards to the document is um, I know we're talking about RFQ and RFP, but I didn't see anywhere where there's language on, on how the city, whether it's CDD, the mayor's office, uh, is going to help collaborating uh, agencies make the program successful. Uh, my dilemma here is that it's great that we have public money going out to the community, but there's also lack of reinforcement of middle management when it comes to implementation, implementation of program. And it always comes down to the street level as seen as the failure, where in my eyes, I think it's the failure of those in charge at, at city levels to make sure that we get the best uh, information, uh, the best uh, data processing services that we can, and also that there's linkages between uh, law enforcement um, and other uh, health providers so that those that are uh, able to adhere to the program are not left out on their own and then criticized because they weren't able to have the youth succeed or, and or their family. So that's my only concern, that there's no language there linking the, the city as their responsibility to this program. Well, I'd like to add to that comment. I appreciate that and, and you're accurate in, in your understanding of what one of the elements that we need to uh, provide sir, uh, resources for. And when I say that, what I mean by that is government and, uh, for example, the city has staff. And uh, we appropriately ask of that staff um, uh, to handle certain responsibilities. But when it comes to third-party providers, especially not-for-profits, what we tend to do is we tend to minimally fund them. And then we assume that somehow, some way, they're going to find the resources to have the, the people power and the hours dedicated to that kind of correspondence, coming to meetings, uh, providing correspondence, providing written correspondence, uh, having uh, uh, interactive meetings with staff of, of the government that actually talk about uh, what they need to do next and how they can and learn and grow together, et cetera. That takes hours. That takes time. And many times what we do is we underfund organizations and then we expect them to do that. And then the organizations are reluctant to come forward and put their hand up and say, isn't it time we do so? Because they're overrun uh, by, by not having either the ability to hire the expertise and or hone their own skills internally to make sure that they can actually afford to do that while still providing services on the street. So that's a great point. And one of the things that we need to make sure that we put in our contracts is uh, allow organizations to understand and sign on the dotted line, but holding ourselves accountable by putting in that contract that if we provide them with the resources for that kind of correspondence and that kind of growth, that they will adhere to that and they will follow through with that. But I think it's inappropriate for us to consider it to be inherent in a contract with a third party organization to expect them to do so, yet at the same time, we're not willing to acknowledge that funds are needed and or uh, financial resources are needed for them to fortify themselves with that ability. Is that one of the things that you'd like to see in these contracts? Absolutely. It's just uh, over the past, and I speak more on, on, the, on the county uh, contracts. But that's been uh, a problem that we've had to uh, overcome, especially when uh, you sign contracts where referrals are quote unquote guaranteed and we're, we're having to do our own legwork and going out and meeting with teachers, law enforcement, desk sergeants, office personnel, and, and there's just no one, no one there to say, okay, this is a legitimate uh, referral, so we're, we're not going to count this or we're going to count it for you. And that's the struggle. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Bill? Bill Martinez, Director of the, of the uh, Unity Collaborative. Uh, and I guess some general comments. One is that in reading this, I, I'm, 
I'm thinking more in terms of an RFP than an RFQ. This reads like an RFP. What it doesn't ask is your history of providing these services in the past. It says, how will you? So uh, in, there's a tone issue there. There also is a confusion in, in my mind between the prong one and prong two services that I, could, I think could be clarified. As you're discussing the histories of these services, I think the prong one particularly can be broken out to various levels that reflect the nature of the relationships with the various neighborhoods that they're dealing with and a lot more clarity and a lot better understanding of how there's a linear process in working with each neighborhood uh, and, and how that all fits in within the realm of what they're trying to do overall to provide the, the peace treaties, the mediation, and all the rest of it. I think there's an opportunity to be much more clarifying uh, and as a result give the city a lot more information to base their, their ultimate determinations on. Also, I, I see a couple of things in here that I'm really uh, concerned about in terms of the nature of the work that's going to be given to the contractors. Uh, and specifically, there's a couple of places where you talk about uh, data gathering and some other issues that I think are much better developed uh, centrally than given to each different organization to have to develop because then you're going to end up with how many different sets of, of systems that the city would have to integrate to come up with something that allows you to track these programs across the city and over time. So I would suggest that uh, you could develop a set of what that criteria would be. Um, and, and what's here under point 14 is almost entirely within the realm of uh, individual services, more of those prong two services than the group stuff. So I think there's a whole other set that needs to be developed along those lines. Uh, we can work with you on, on doing that, obviously. Absolutely. You know everybody is, is more than willing Whatever to. Whatever input uh, you can forward to this committee uh, okay. is, is very important to us. And again, for the first time, uh, I think the City of Los Angeles is actually developing a process that is uh, taking into account what's going on on the streets and what are the practical ways in which we address these issues rather than looking at it from a philosophical and a, an That's academic right. Right. Uh, uh, method of saying, well, this is what we need. Um, now, I'm not saying that there's no value in the prior way in which we did business, but I think that I think there's greater value in uh, taking feedback from the communities and the people who are actually doing the work of today and yesterday and hopefully we'll continue to do the work of tomorrow and actually learn from them so that we can actually make something that's applicable to what should be done on the streets rather than uh, trying to just um, say that because some PhDs drew it up, that means it must work. Trust me, I have <laughs> met many, many PhDs in my life and some of them uh, might be good at writing books, but God help us if they ever hit the streets and try to implement those things on the streets because on a practical basis and a realistic basic a basis, some of those things just don't work. Uh, I remember my father with a first grade education, the best teacher I ever had. And he used to stop me in the middle of doing work sometimes. And uh, because he only had a first grade education, uh, he would just figure out ways to get me to think. And one, one of the things he used to love to say to all of us, he had, there were 11 of us children, when we saw us frustrated, he'd say, go grab the encyclopedia and see if you can find the answer in the book. And then we'd look at him and say, you can't find that answer in the book. And he says, that's right. He says, now do you want me to help you figure it out? And we always said, reluctantly, yes. And then he would show us the practical way in which you get things done. Uh, you know, uh, we used to pull down trees together. Trust me, there were some ways in which we, you could only get it done through experience without letting it fall in the house. And uh, I was amazed how many times he was able to do that. Again, first grade education, he worked with his hands all of his life, and yet he taught me so much. Here I am trying to do things and be a policymaker, yet at the same time, I count on his wisdom more than I count on any professor that ever taught me any bit of engineering that I've ever learned. So uh, the, the reason why I give you that example is I want to make sure that people understand I am not looking to titles to learn what we need to learn to do what we need to do in this city. I am looking to practical commitment. I'm looking to people. There's something called heart. Sometimes that is hard to put into a contract, but somehow, some way, some organizations have figured out ways in which they can put that into practice and actually get results. Uh, unfortunately, all too often government thinks that those elements should not or have no place formally, uh, that they don't need to be recognized. And in this committee, we are recognizing that. And we're trying to do the difficult work of making sure that we can put that somehow, some way in writing, in contracts, so that we can actually have a much, much better practical practitioner-based system for the city. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Now, when it comes to the CLA, when it comes to uh, um, shared administrative services, uh, when it comes to third parties, there's nothing that we anticipate that a third party couldn't contract with somebody to assist them uh, in, in communicating with the city. For, for example, if, if, if there's an organization that actually does street level services and they, it, it appears that in an interview process they score very well, yet at the same time they admit that they don't have the administrative services in house, there's nothing that we anticipate that would preclude them to, for them to say we will contract with somebody to provide that, that element no. to, uh, to, in order for us to complete our holistic venture here to contract with the city. No. no, the the scope of work described specifically does allow for agencies to apply as a as a collaborative to meet Contact all of the partner. right to meet all of the qual all of the necessary qualifications, including administrative that the city has. Just you know, as as a steward of public funds, so it, in the event that an agency recognizes that they may not have the administrative capacity to meet those types of qualifications but they could provide the services there's nothing stopping them from identifying a partner who could do that part of the work for them so that they could do the the direct service provision according to what's requested in the in the document okay thank you um uh, shalon joseph Sorry. item number one Good morning, Councilman. Shalon Joseph with the LA County Public Defender's Office. Um, I just want to speak to you briefly to the mental health. Shalon, excuse me, I need to ask you a question before yes. I forget. Um, does the city of Los Angeles, uh, <clears throat> as far as you're aware, contract services with the county? Um, in terms for, for the when it comes to uh, addressing the issue of uh, violence or, or gang violence and things of that nature? Not that I'm aware of. Um, what I mean, I'm getting at is yeah, I, we, we yeah. have services rendered within the city of Los Angeles where city dollars actually go to get a, uh, additional assistance, from my understanding, from the DA's office? Correct, yes. Probation? Yeah, clear. You're talking about clear and probation. Yes, yeah. you're, you're right. And what, what, is, what, is the primary, what is the primary focus and responsibility of the DA's office? To prosecute. To prosecute, okay. And then the probation office? to monitor and supervi supervise and file people violence. on probation people on probation okay and your department what is it again we're the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office and what is your primary function my primary function is um, I'm a, a juvenile defender within our office assigned to a special unit where I represent uh, youth who are incarcerated in the Division of Juvenile Justice and prior to that was um, spent two years in uh, juvenile court uh, representing youth who were um, involved in the juvenile justice system. Can you tell me again what the core responsibility of, of your department is? To defend youth who are charged, youth and adults who are charged with, with criminal offenses. Okay. So you're basically affording people their, their rights as stated in the Constitution? Correct. Okay. Um, now, are you familiar with the term fiduciary yes. responsibility? Yes. What's the fiduciary responsibility of the DA's office to, to the best of your understanding beyond prosecuting? Is there an extended uh, fiduciary responsibility to the constituencies? Well, specifically those constituents that are probably going to be uh, uh, addressed with intervention programs? Well, I would, I mean, my personal opinion is that their fiduciary duty is to make sure that, that they are participating with the best way to service this population if we're talking about gang intervention and that means to i'm talking um, about the da's office right i mean I, I think that we're we should all be under the same goal which is justice for the youth and if and that means providing them adequate services adequate resources adequate re-entry transition services and that the da should be a part of, of that solution um, but but by and large the services that are rendered to the constituents of the city of Los Angeles when we ask for extra services in the DA's office, what, what are the basic services that we ask of them? Suppression services. Suppression services. Correct. And then when it comes to the fiduciary responsibilities of, of probation? The same. But, the, but what are, two questions. What is their fiduciary responsibility beyond their basic inherent responsibility 
as a probation department. And then I'll get into the question of what <laughs> services are we asking them to render to the constituents of the City of Los Angeles? Well, I mean, again, you know, the probation department's um, mission is to um, rehabilitate. I, I mean, they have a youth department and an adult department. I'm speaking specifically to the youth, the okay. juvenile department, is to rehabilitate youth, to provide them services. If they're on probation, to provide them services. They get funded to provide services, referrals to appropriate agencies, referrals to appropriate intervention services, reentry, re relocation. Um, and to make sure that we are attempting to re rehabilitate the minor. Um, as you know, when a minor is, um, um, is, is sentenced by the judge to probation, custody is taken from the parents and placed into probation's hands. And so that's the actual language. The word is it's take, it's custody and control is taken away from the parents and placed within the Department of Probation. So what you're describing is in, in the situation of, of youth, when they're assigned to a probation officer, then the custodial responsibilities revert to the probation department through the probation officers and it is no longer primarily on the parent or parents? Correct. That is the language that the court uses. I mean, they work in conjunction with, with the parent if they're home on probation, but let's say they're sent to camp, they're living within a probationary setting day in and day out. And but how about if they're on probation and they're on, still living with their family, right. but home they're on, on probation? The home on probation, probation still is, has conditions. The minor still has to abide by conditions imposed by the court, and probation is there to facilitate those conditions. And if those conditions aren't being met, then they, they seek violations through the court. And then what does a probation officer do when somebody violates their probation? Ask for a, a harsher punishment. They submit a violation to the court, a hearing is held, and generally my experience has been that we, there's aggregated, um, aggregated punishment at that consequences at that point. Does if a you, probation officer at that point uh, then have the responsibility in some cases to actually confiscate that individual from the streets and put them, take them back and, and put them either in a, uh, a program, basically take them off the streets? Yes. <clears throat> if they're on probation and the, the violation is being sought, generally the youth will be placed back in detention by the probation officer and a, a violation petition will be filed in the court. Okay. So you work for a department within the county of Los Angeles? Correct. And the probation department is from the, within the county of Los Angeles. Correct. And then also the DA's office is within the county of Los Angeles. Correct. And is your department receiving any funds that you're aware of from the city of Los Angeles to assist in the matter that's before us? No. But probation is and the DA's office is? Yes. And I mean, we, we the public defender's office is the only office that um, services these kids from the point of entry into the juvenile justice system. I mean, there are panel attorneys, but I'm sp speaking specifically for our office. Um, we are the only office um, right now in the state that, ha that has 17 psychiatric social workers on staff in the juvenile division. And the city of Los Angeles has never asked formally for the assistance of your office uh, to address our constituents with those 11 workers? No. And we also- Do they have those, do, do they have those workers with those titles in the DA's office? No. Do they have workers with those titles in the probation office? Yes. They do? They do have social workers with, in the Department of, of Probation, yes. And, but their, their activity, those social workers within the probation office and the social workers within your office, is there a difference between what their daily responsibilities are? I don't know, I can't speak specifically to what their daily responsibilities are with probation, but what I can speak to is that we have in each juvenile office in the county one or two social workers that are specifically de dedicated to evaluating the youth that we're representing if we feel that there are school issues or mental health issues involved with that youth. And there, is not, there are not probation social workers who are in the court working with that individual. So I think it's a different setup. In addition to having the 17 social workers, we do have eight resource attorneys who are assigned to each of the juvenile courts who, who deal specifically with regional center issues and issues relating to um, 
special education so that we are out in the communities advocating, attending IEPs, advocating for better services if our clients are um, our um, special education students. Now, what you just described of the real activities that are going on with your particular department within the county of Los Angeles, did you say that you're the only one department? There are departments like that in every county, I suspect. Correct. But you're the only, we're the only county that actually has these additional services coming out of that department? Yes, to the, to the extent that, that we have it. I mean, um, I know that there are some other counties who are beginning to hire social workers, but there are, is no other county who it has social workers as well as additional resource attorneys. So at the point of entry to the juvenile justice system, the minor will have the attorney who's handling the case, they will have a psychiatric social worker, and they will have another attorney specifically dedicated to any cognitive issues or special education issues. So there's a team of three, sometimes four, if, there's a, if, the, if the youth is looking at being incarcerated in the Division of Juvenile Justice, then they'll bring me in. So then that, then that person will have three attorneys plus a social worker. And I don't, there's no other county that has that set up. And we, are, we do not receive city funding for that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Continue. Um, my, um, my issue um, is when I'm looking over the data, data collection that the city consider under mental health risk factors that we are um, considering that persons who are doing um, mental health evaluations do have some background in child adolescence and specifically cognitive disabilities. We know that a lot of our youth um, who are involved in the juvenile justice system um, have cognitive disabilities. Most of them are um, special education students um, and, and their studies have shown that if you are, have certain um, special education specific learning disability and or emotional disturbance that a lot of the cases are um, filed from the school setting where where IEPs are not implemented correctly. So um, I, I, I do think for this population that- What's an IEP? An individual education plan, individualized education plan. And, and is an individual edu uh, individualized education plan, is that something that's supposed to be mandatory or is that some, something that the schools just do if they feel like it? Well, there- there is um, a California education code that says that the schools are supposed to seek out individual education plans if the student is meeting certain criteria. Um, and once, the I, once an IEP is in place, then they are mandated to follow through with those services. Um, so in, in that regard, I do believe that under the, the mental, specifically for the mental health um, risk factors that we are dealing with persons who do have some background in adolescent behavior and development um, specifically to this population. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, item one cards, Bobby Arias and Torrance Reese. Councilman, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, Bobby Arias, President of Community and Schools, been at this 20 years. Uh, and before that, spent 14 years in higher education, and I can attest that there is good research and there's bad research. Uh, there are people on campus that uh, have taken the time to deal with practitioners and have a really solid base in their research, and there are others who have just researched the literature, which oftentimes can be dated. It can be in, in process we're dealing with now, 70s. Uh, and that's not to say it doesn't have some relevance to 2000, but one begins to question when few people uh, come out and see what it is the practitioners are doing, and there are many of them in this room. And that really serves as a segue and a backdrop to what I want to commend, uh, because the emphasis here is as you say. Uh, I think that just a slight digression, uh, digression, the hardest pill to swallow is to have to go to seminars where they bring in experts from Omaha, Nebraska, Portland, Oregon, uh, San Francisco, and that is to say they don't have something to offer, but the genesis of this epidemic began here. And my family has been here since the late 1800s, so, you know, we, we've been around. Uh, and this has been an issue. My 86-year-old mother says, are we going to get it right this time? I believe that we're getting it right this time, and let me tell you why. 
Uh, unlike, and, and I don't want to sound sour grapes, so if I do, I apologize at the outset. And so to be transparent, we did not get the GRZ. And when I see the factors on the but initial... That was, that was, you're talking about a prevention. Right, the, yes. the, the step one. This is intervention. Step one of this, and I would hope that there would be some... But the fact of the matter is everybody from the mayor's office to the council, everybody uh, involved in this revamping of how we're addressing services when it comes to intervention and prevention, integration is critical. And everybody said that integration is critical. I would hope so. I hope that that would be our emphasis. Because yeah. regardless, I've been through... Uh, stars and bridges and now whatever this is going to be and we live there and whatever happens happens but we're going to be there when this is done too so I, my whole hope is to create ponderables that help us to make to develop policy that's truly relevant to the field and there are a lot of practitioners here in the room what I want to emphasize is is and commend is the emphasis on experience here when on the front end, the one that we're dealing with now, experience is rated only 20 points. Something's wrong. And I'll deal with that on the appeals process. But as we deal now with this situation, uh, I, I think it's great that we're making a statement as a city. And we're, we're not excluding. This is what I like about this. Here are the prong one, prong two. Here are the non-negotiables. If your agency isn't doing these things for this population, then we're going to have an a, a academy, whatever we're going to institute, whatever we're going to call that, that's going to allow us to get you to that point. But if your teen pregnancy last year, as you stated in the council meeting, this might get in another line. And I think what it's helping us do as practitioners is help us really get into what is the experience base that we have that truly speaks to this population and ultimately dealing with lessening violence in our city. Thank you. Okay. First, I want to thank the committee for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to speak to the issue of mentoring. You mentioned uh, earlier a conversation you had with your father when you were a youngster and how valuable that was to you in terms of uh, giving you some, um, you know, options in terms of solving some of your own problems. Um, I've been over the L.A. Bridges program at Audubon Middle School for the past nine years. And one of the phenomena that I think is central to this issue of the problems that we see uh, in children in terms of gang uh, involvement, et cetera, is a missing father's syndrome. I would say 85 to sometimes 90 percent of the young people in my classroom don't have a father at home. And uh, for various reasons, uh, some of them are incarcerated, some of them have uh, passed away, uh, some from violence, some from natural causes, and et cetera. And uh, I think that at some point, uh, because I, I did not see in the, in the proposal uh, a concerted or a specific effort to, to deal with the missing father syndrome, and I think at some point we're going to have to get really serious about really focusing on the family, helping uh, families to, to mend their, their wounds so that uh, the children won't suffer so much. I think many of the children's uh, behavior stem from the, the lack of uh, information and love and caring and concern that they would get from their families. And if 85% of the children uh, in a classroom don't have a father at home, then there's a whole lot of issues that that brings to the table. So I just wanted to make sure that I, if, if given the opportunity, had the opportunity to speak about uh, the issue of mentoring, which is something we've done for the past four years uh, over at Audubon. And there is an effort at Audubon Middle School in particular to uh, place male teachers in front of, of, of particularly male youth and, and to develop all male classrooms. And I think uh, I would have to say that females have the same issues, so I, w I won't discount that. But I wanted to take this opportunity to mention that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And as I said earlier, uh, the input that we receive in this committee is utilized and it is, uh, we do pay attention and we do try to make sure that we uh, address as much of uh, the issues that we need to address before we provide our policy solutions. Uh, Mr. Arias, can you come forward? Sorry, it really is only 30 seconds, but again, uh, the thing I didn't say was, uh, I think what we've learned, and I don't see it here and I'll peruse this, I apologize, uh, we need to, there needs, the questions I'm getting in the community is who reads these, these proposals. So I would encourage the city to take a look at what orientations we're providing the readers, what experience, what qualifies them to read, 
because uh, I was dumbfounded when I got our response because it, it didn't so, it didn't feel like they understood the population and or what it is we're trying to do with these initiatives. So I, I just throw that out. Are we looking at who is actually evaluating and reading these RFPs, RFQs? Thank you. Um, let me clarify for the record. This is the first um, RFP or RFQ process that this committee and or myself, Councilman Tony Cardenas, is going to have collaboration and input with the mayor's office on. The RFP process for the uh, prevention was something that I did not have input in. I did not, uh, uh, was not even aware of the dates in which they were going to uh, put that out to the community, et cetera. I was not aware about the details, uh, some of the things that you pointed out, Mr. Arias. So the fact of the matter is there's not much that I can say to that, but what I can promise you is when it comes to this process, I'm going to be very engaged. I'm very pleased uh, uh, to say that I've been working very closely with Jeff Carr from the mayor's office, and uh, him and I have assured each other uh, consistently and continuously that we both want to assist each other in making the best product possible and the best process possible. So on this process, I will be much more um, um, uh, able to comment today, tomorrow, and forever on this RFQ, RFP process when it comes to intervention. But when it comes to prevention, I had little to nothing to do with that. And, uh, uh, but I will see it as the council is, in fact, the last word on contracts such as these. And uh, I will see it as it comes to council in the near future. Um, any more public comment cards uh, on item number one? Item number one is open for public comment. Uh, seeing and hearing none, public comment on item number one is closed. Um, I want to remind everybody uh, that we are, item number one is <coughs> dealing with the issue of addressing the issues on the streets of Los Angeles pertaining to violence. Many people describe it as gang violence. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, homicides in this city and most recently uh, of six homicides that occurred within a few days of each other. Uh, the police department, uh, rightfully so, and, uh, and respectfully and responsibly uh, announced that only one of those six murders uh, were gang-related. Uh, this inter intervention process is here to address all issues of violence in the city of Los Angeles, particularly the issues of violence that are in and around the most disadvantaged communities within the city. In addition to that, I want to remind you, and I quote uh, Chief Bratton when he said, we cannot arrest ourselves out of this problem. That is a fact. The city of Los Angeles has embarked in the last couple of years and continues Regardless of the, the financial woes of this city, we continue to keep and adhere to the process of hiring an additional thousand officers over and above what we had two years ago. We are continuing to do so, even after we have those additional thousand officers, unless we get our act together when it comes to prevention and intervention in this city and we act responsibly and efficiently and appropriately we will continue to have major issues and problems, and these problems will not curtail in the city. That's why it's so important that we get this right and we do this right. Most of the time, most committees in the city of Los An for the city of Los Angeles will in fact have an item on the agenda, and they will move this item along for the purposes of just being expedient. That is not the way this committee operates. So with that, because of the input that we've received today, I'm going to remind the CLA's office to go ahead and incorporate any other relevancies that have come to light between the date that this report was submitted to this committee and you have the opportunity and responsibility to go ahead and amend this report as we will hear that again next week in this committee. And then once we do so, then we will decide uh, as a committee whether or not we're going, it's ready to be voted on and forwarded. Okay. So with that, public comment is closed, and we move on to item number two as we hold this item in committee. And uh, again, uh, report back from the uh, CLA's office as they have a right and a responsibility to add anything else to this report that they deem necessary. Thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, we move to item number two. Item number two continued from June 12, 2008. Community Development Department report in response to motion. Cardinals Perry relative to instructing the CDD to report city contracting requirements as they are related to the closure of the LA Bridges 1 and 2 programs. CDD to support support to facilitate effective program transition efforts undertaken by the CDD to notify current LA Bridges contractors of the transition and related matters. Also refer to the Housing Community and Economic Development Committee. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my first point or question to CDD, uh, when we uh, heard the preliminaries of this, the last time we had this in committee, I asked of the C uh, Community Development Department to uh, notify uh, any or all of the current uh, Bridges 1 and Bridges 2 contractors that we will have this item in committee today. Were you successful in doing so? Yes, we did, and okay. a number of them are here with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, I remind everybody in the room, if you'd like to address this committee, there are public comment cards in the back. You will need to fill one out. I will call you up in the order that I receive them, give them to the clerk to my left, and we will give you an opportunity to make public comment on this item, item number two. CDD. Zita Davis with CDD. Uh, as the council member mentioned uh, last week, CDD did a verbal report on the status of the LA Bridges transition from CDD to the mayor's office. Uh, we've since then provided a written report for your review, uh, and so we are prepared to respond to any uh, questions that you have that were not um, uh, answered perhaps last week. Okay. Um, let me uh, read a statement to the public. Effective July 1st, 2008, the city of Los Angeles will have one place for accountability for its gang intervention programs and prevention programs. For the past two and a half years, the Ad Hoc Committee on Gang Violence and Youth Development has been the policy clearinghouse for all youth development and intervention prevention and reentry policy making for those programs. Um, today's discussion has to do with having a full public discussion on the LA Bridges 1 and 2 programs. I anticipate that the mayor's office will not be calling these programs Bridges 1 and Bridges 2. So it appears that the chapter is closing on the formal uh, 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 Bridges 1 and Bridges 2 programs, although we will continue uh, to have activities, uh, if not in some cases the same and or similar to what uh, was going on with the Bridges 1 and Bridges 2 pro uh, programs within the city. Um, so with that, um, I'd like uh, the um, um, Community Development Department to describe for us uh, once again what is the transition plan and what are the things that we can anticipate in the coming days and weeks and what kind of activity and or relevancy to these programs will CDD have after July 1st? The uh, department, so CDD, is transitioning the LA Bridges program, uh, Bridges One, which is our prevention services that take place at 27 middle schools throughout the city. Um, also, uh, intervention uh, that's provided through four contractors uh, throughout the city, as well as safe passages services that are provided in two ways. Uh, one, uh, in conjunction with our prevention services at the 27 middle school sites, as well as through um, uh, several contractors that provided at five high school sites. Um, the transition so Br Bridges one is is better described as mostly prevention, That's and correct. Bridges two is better described as mostly intervention. Yes. Okay. And I say mostly because there's always, um, um, at least on the edges of responsibilities, fiduciary responsibilities that organizations have on their daily activities to not say oh wait a minute, you just stepped into an intervention uh, service, so I can't, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. My point is that, that there's always uh, um, a little bit of both, even though the primary responsibility in Bridges 2 is intervention and the primary responsibility in Bridges 1 is prevention. Yes, that's okay. correct. Thank you. So the transition uh, process began as early as April. Uh, the department immediately after the mayor's State of the City address uh, called all the Bridges contractors uh, to CDD so that we could discuss uh, some of the changes that were proposed in the mayor's proposed budget. Uh, the mayor's office, uh, we've been working in conjunction with them since April uh, throughout the transition process. They were available in April to respond to questions uh, that were specific uh, uh, to the mayor's office. Uh, so the contractors had the opportunity to ask questions and get responses directly from uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Jeff Carr. 
Uh, since then, the department has been working on a variety of administrative processes uh, in preparation for moving the contracts, uh, the programs, but primarily the uh, the contracts to the mayor's office. Um, those some of those. Uh, Administrative tasks include preparing the scope of services, so that's the work that the contractors will do for the uh, what is going to be a six-month uh, transition process beginning July 1 and ending December 30th. Uh, we have worked with the contractors in trying to solicit input from them in advance uh, so that perhaps if there were things that we could not anticipate, uh, because of changes we were making in the contract uh, to make sure that they had an opportunity for comment. Uh, so there was a, a brief comment period so they could look at the scope of services, the changes that we were proposing, and provide us with some, some input so that we could finalize the contract. Uh, the services that the contractors will be providing from July through December are reduced uh, since it is a six-month contract. Their funding is approximately half of their year contract. Um, in addition, the uh, services that they are providing are, um, for the most part, reduced uh, by half as well. For example, um, uh, they had to provide services for 50 case-managed students uh, in the prevention contract. Uh, so in the six months following or that are coming, they will be providing services for approximately 25 youth. Um, but so let me clarify something. When you say in half, the time element is six months, not 12. Correct. But on a daily basis, the daily or monthly activities shall remain the same. For the most part, yes. They will be providing youth development services for the population that they have been serving. Um, for example, mm -hmm. if somebody appropriately describes their responsibilities and service they're going to provide to constituents and uh, say it's a program where they start off with 50 identified individuals and they and they take them through a 12-month program uh, that doesn't mean that they will only have 25 individuals in that program for six months I would imagine what that means is they will have 50 individuals for six months yes and, and actually the the contractors as, as they have made the department aware uh, have a number of clients that are already that have already enrolled in their programs and so they are taking responsibility for their existing clients. Uh, we have asked that they not uh, enroll new clients at a certain point about the halfway mark uh, mm -hmm. September 30th uh, but yes they are planning to transition all of the youth that they are responsible for the LA Bridges clients to other services throughout the city. So, so yes to answer your question. Okay. All right uh, and so uh, I wanted to summarize um, the major parts of work that the, the contractors will be providing from July through December. Uh, one we just talked about, which is transitioning the youth um, from their existing bridges services to other services in the city. Um, they are being encouraged to look at the uh, family development networks at CDD, the neighborhood action programs in CDD. They are also um, uh, class parks um, program um, that exists in the city outside of that the LA Unified Beyond the Bell after school programs were appropriate and then any other local programs uh, that may exist in the areas where the, the contractors are, are serving the youth. Um, so transitioning youth is one piece. Uh, the second piece are uh, obviously the closeout activities that the contractors will have to do. Um, there are a number of administrative and uh, fiscal as well as programmatic uh, details that they will have to respond to prepare uh, in order to end the program by December 31st. Uh, the contractors are familiar with closeout, uh, what we would term as a soft closeout because we've done it every year because we amend the, pro the contracts. However, this year is different. We're uh, considering this a hard closeout, uh, so they will uh, be accountable for all their funds, uh, any property um, or city equipment that they may have purchased over the years, uh, as well as the transition of um, their staff, their program staff, and then any, uh, any youth as well. When it comes to Bridges One, <clears throat> how many youth were serviced, or a uh, round figure of how many youth we service in Bridges One? It's uh, roughly about 4,000 youth that the prevention contractors serve. And intervention? Is roughly about 2,000. So about 6,000 individuals are serviced uh, roughly uh, Correct. Um, in a 12-month period. Yes. What's the anticipated or do you have any understanding or semblance of understanding is what the, the new system is going to service? 
uh, in the mayor's office? So, I, I can't speak to the, the details in the mayor's gang reduction and youth development programs. Um, it is our understanding that uh, there may be some youth that are currently uh, receiving services through Bridges providers uh, that may be appropriately placed in the uh, programs in the gang reduction zones, um, but I can't speak to what types of services they'll be receiving there. Some may be similar to what is currently being provided. Uh, we have to make the assumption that some will be different as well. Okay. When you say you have to make the assumption, um, I take it um, um, you're here to receive information from the mayor's office, not to ask of information of the mayor's office? Well, the department has been working with the mayor's office throughout this process. Uh, we have focused primarily on the transition, so moving uh, from CDD to the mayor's office. Uh, we haven't discussed in detail the services um, that would be available for the Bridges youth, other than understanding that some of them, some of the services would be appropriate uh, for some of the LA Bridges youth. Now, I, I presume that uh, CDD is, uh, ma has made themselves available to give any advice uh, that the mayor's office requests, but it's up to the mayor's office to request that advice. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. As far as uh, the status of the transition, uh, the prevention contractors, so LA Bridges One contractors, uh, receive their contracts uh, at the end of May. Uh, at this point, we have uh, approximately half of the required documents uh, from the contractors. We anticipating having all of them um, by the end of next week, which is when the department is planning to give all of the prepared contracts to the mayor's office. Um, the LA Bridges II prevention contracts, as well as the safe passages contracts, uh, were slightly delayed. Uh, and those will also be ready by the end of next week. Uh, as you know, uh, City Council um, added additional funding to the intervention contracts, uh, 600000 And so uh, the mayor's additional office. Additional funding for the summer months. That's correct. Yes. Uh, the mayor's office, CDD worked with the mayor's office to solicit input from the contractors. Uh, the contractors were very quick in providing their proposals to the department. Uh, we have since included the, their information. We've um, solidified the funding. Uh, and so their contracts will be going out to them today. We anticipate getting the uh, signature pages and required um, documents from them by mid next week. And again, keeping us on track to deliver all the paperwork contracts necessary to the mayor's office so that we could do timely execution. What, what, a, what services or what activities will CDD uh, provide uh, relative to what's shifting over to the mayor's office um, after July 1st? CDD will continue to provide ongoing technical assistance to the mayor's office. Um, that is in the form of, uh, let's see, uh, one would be we have experienced staff accountants that will be on loan to the mayor's office that will be assisting in their fiscal uh, payment process. Um, another way is um, whenever any type of uh, questions come up, either administratively, uh, fiscal related, particularly as it relates to closeout, uh, that CDD staff is available to not only respond to questions, uh, participate in meetings that they might have with contractors, uh, but in any way assist them. Uh, and then lastly, uh, through training, that if the mayor's office uh, sees a need for any specific training, either for, you know, again, administration or fiscal, that the department is available to provide that as well. Anything else? Um, well, this is a big shift. Um, when it comes to ISIS, uh, ISIS is the system that we use to track clients? Yes, it is. Um, when it comes to Bridges One, how many clients are, in the, uh, are being tracked by ISIS in, in Bridges One? All the clients in uh, LA Bridges One Prevention are being tracked by ISIS. And Bridges Two? Bridges Two is not yet up on the ISIS system. Okay. Um, well, so therefore, it would be up to the mayor's office, I presume, to decide it, um, how they're going to track the clients if they will continue to use ISIS uh, for the array of programs that they're going to be responsible for. That's correct. Okay. And you've afforded them all the information you think is necessary for them to interpret how they want to handle that? 
David Esparza, Assistant General Manager at uh, CDD. Yes, we have uh, been, you know, very actively working with them and in communication for the uh, those components of the system that will be needed to upgrade in order to expand to the new uh, uh, program in the mayor's office, as well as maintaining existing uh, databases and services under the current system. Okay, and what's the timeline of that being available to be utilized? Well, at this particular point, we haven't uh, we haven't ex uh, really gotten down into the program development uh, portions of that uh, the new program pieces uh, as determined by the the mayor's office. So uh, that's still in a uh, in a you know, condition of flux right now. The maintenance of existing uh, data sources uh, will continue, although there's there will be uh, some cost. Uh, uh, attached to it going forward as a maintenance uh, portion. Uh, the, you're aware that the the people that were attached, you know, within our department to the bridges programs, and that is also the uh, systems uh, uh, support group. Uh, those people have have gone through the you know replacement through the personnel department into other other uh, departments within the city, and so. We don't. Uh, we have placed those people outside of our department, and so if they wanted to maintain this system or expand the system going forward, we would have to then find new people to bring back into the department to uh, carry out those functions. But at this particular point, we're really in a, in a maintenance mode with the existing uh, system and databases. Mm -hmm. So that request. Uh to restructure that would be uh, the decision of the mayor's office to make that request? Yes. Okay. So to, to the mayor's office to decide how they want to recognize this information and, and what system they want to use to track. Exactly. Or if there's uh, expansions or enhancements to the existing system that they would want to build in that might capture new data and information for uh, their tracking purposes. All right. Thank you. Anybody here from the mayor's office? Okay. Um, okay. I'm sure the council will have some questions to the mayor's office sooner or later on uh, how the transition is coming along. All right. We'll now move to public comment cards for item number two. We have Sandra Bryant, Jose Espeda, please. Thank you. My name is Sandra Bryant. I'm the executive director of All People's Christian Center. We are a LA Bridges One lead agency and have been so uh, for the entire process of LA Bridges. Prior to that, we also provided services through LA Stars. Um, when, and, when were the years of LA Stars? Two, or I think a year and a half prior to LA Bridges. So when was LA Bridges? Oh, um, 10, 11 years ago? Thank you, 1997. Uh, so we've been a part of the process and its evolution of 1995 or so since 1995 correct and our agency itself has provided services to the youth and families in that community for 66 years so prior to city support we have been a part of the community and we're located uh, South LA John Adams Middle School is our school I wanted to uh, first of all to say thank you for the support that we've had over the last um, 11 years uh, we have been working with CDD to transition youth and families into services I think it would be helpful though to look at in communities where transition is not possible because there are not services available, the FDNs may not be available or other programs provided by the city may not be available. 
Um, so I hope that you will do that at the end because I think it will be important and we will not realize it until January at the end of the LA Bridges program. Thank you. Thank you. Jose Esqueda, program manager for ADAP. Um, we also have a Bridges One component at uh, Cochrane Middle School. Um, we've been in the community for about 35 years and we've been uh, doing the program of LA Bridges uh, since uh, it's first started in 1995 or six. Um, just I'm hearing a lot about the transition and we've just submitted our transition plan and all of our budget to the mayor's office. Um, and I, you know, quite frankly, I'm just a little terrified of the fact that it was going out under the mayor's office. And it's planning, planning and the reality is two different things. And I think we're planning to transition all of our youth, but like Sandy said, the nearest FDN is 10 miles away. The nearest NAP is about nine miles away. The other nearest community-based organization is about six miles away. And we hope to transition as many youth as we can and, and hold into ADAP services as many youth as we can. Um, and we wanted to transition several youth into the new grid zones, um, whoever that may be. Uh, but the reality is that very few of our Bridges youth will be served by the new grid, grid zone, at least in my area. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, that, and that saddens me. The community is just left uh, hanging. Uh, the other thing is, yeah, we want to serve 50 youth every single month and from now until December. And that's the plan. The reality is I may not have staff next month because their guarantee of a job is only until December. So um, that's the reality. I think... Um, Staff, I know staff are already looking for other jobs because uh, we can't place them within ADAP. So, um, you know, my Bridges program may end November, may end October, depending on when, how fast my staff leave the, and vacate their offices. Um, so that's, that's the reality of things. Um, and I think um, it's important for you to, and this committee to hear that, that it, it's the transitions be devastating as well. I appreciate uh, <clears throat> you coming forward and expressing your concerns. Um, I wish I would have heard you and your concerns when the controller uh, was basically screaming at the top of her lungs, going to every venue, uh, television, newspapers, radio, saying that this stuff had to be moved in the mayor's office and that was some kind of panacea our answer to all the issues that we have uh, since then as a policymaker in the city I have tried every way that I can to make the best policy I can out of that momentum and that movement that seemed to be growing in this city uh, and I want to state for the record again a lot of people tried to label that as a council member was fighting with the controller. I was not fighting with her. I have no business. I have no right. I have no responsibility to fight with a fellow elected. But I do have the responsibility, and it is my business, to try to make the best of whatever policy that is needed for this city. Um, I understand your concerns, and unfortunately, there are very likely going to be uh, inaccuracies in the services provided to all the constituents that were provided services yesterday uh, and the services that will be provided for the constituents over the coming 12 months. But uh, at the same time, uh, this is the direction that it seemed like the policymakers in the city wanted to move in, and they were going to do it with or without the support of Tony Cardenas, the councilman, the chairman of this committee. So I felt it was my responsibility and duty to put my ego aside, to put what I think is best aside, and try to make the best of it. The best way that I can put it in derogatory terms for everybody is I had to make chicken salad out of chicken feathers. And if any of you have heard the real saying, there's another way of saying it. <laughs> But this is where we are. And some people are not going to partake in that salad. But in the coming 12 months, we have a lot of responsibility to remain fluid 
and keep our responsibilities before us and try to make the best of it so that at the outcome of the next 12 to 18 months, we have a system in place that is better than the system of today and yesterday and that is serving more constituents at a better level than ever before and that we continue to grow it and then actually create a system that we all know has been inadequate for far too long and create a system that is far closer to being adequate than inadequate. Uh, so this is, these are tough times yes, and especially It is the toughest time for people like you because you're there in the streets. Mm -hmm. You're serving them. I have not met 98% of the constituents that we serve, but yet you've probably met 98% of the constituents that your organization serves. So it's a lot closer to home for you. So I understand, but I think it's important that you speak up, and I appreciate the fact that you have. Thank you. Uh, Bobby Arias, Brenda Shockley. Uh, thank you, Tony, for speaking again. Bobby Arias from Communities and Schools. I, I just want to make a backdrop statement to what I'm going to say. Uh, yesterday I uh, uh, met with the mother who lost her 17-year-old son at Poly High School and finishing the burial process, including headstone and all that. And it just it brought to me um, the importance that in this transition that we can maintain service, that we not lose hold of that that we've uh, achieved. You were part of the march, the peace march we had, and you saw how the community responded. And I say that because I, I want to uh, actually, in, in this particular case, I want to uh, commend Zita uh, Davis. She has been uh, excellent in calling us. Uh, making sure that we understand the tradition process, uh, the transition process, so that we can get the resource, so that that ebb and flow continues with service delivery. Also, I wanted you to be aware that we did attend a meeting at CDD that Jeff Carr uh, facilitated last week, where he stated that this is not his expertise. So I want to, you know, I've had my differences with him, but in this case, I want to commend him for saying, for bringing in the expertise that the city already has, uh, with hopes of just maintaining the service delivery so that we not lose sight uh, of what's happening. And what's happening is that we're losing kids every single day. So I needed to say that for the public record. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to join with Tony and uh, your, your name for the record, Brenda, Brenda Shockley from Community Build. And I wanted to take this opportunity um, for general comments to, to say two things. To one, join with communities and schools and acknowledge publicly the um, outstanding job that CDD has done in a very uncertain and fluid environment. And uh, the professionalism, uh, the responsiveness uh, has really made a difference given um, that we are all in such a state of flux. Well, I, I thank, thank you, Brenda, but I also want to restate, as I've stated before in this committee, it is not the city departments that have failed. I understand. They have done a pretty darn good job with the lack of direction and lack of policy that has been, uh, um, that has not been given them by the policymakers of this city, that meaning the electeds of this city. Um, so. It's unfortunate that since we have um, had more policy activity around this issue than ever before, it's unfortunate that people want to point at the departments as being failures, at pointing at programs in the communities that are failures. But yet at the same time, I have not yet read uh, in any of the reports that we have paid for uh, by this city and I have not read anywhere in those reports, nor have, have I heard anyone, anyone accurately put a name and a face to the failures that people have, uh, they have uh, irresponsibly uh, thrown out uh, to the public. And unfortunately, the press seems to pick up on that more than anything else. Uh, but uh, I just want to state for the record, I think you're accurate and I think you're being responsible and coming forward and speaking up for the CDD department and this is my time, not yours. 
so you can continue to speak. Uh, I just want to let you know that I do appreciate that, and it's important for all of us to understand, once again, it is the policy makers of the city who have failed to give direction and to provide the policy necessary for our departments to implement good policy in the city. And they've done a pretty darn good job with that lack of direction and that lack of basis for what they were supposed to be doing. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I agree so much that they've done an extraordinary job, particularly in the short time we've had and facing not only what do we say to the schools where we are cited, but what do we say to the families and the youth. But I also want to say, um, and thank you for your support, and say to my colleagues that um, after looking carefully, my analysis, there's no way that Ellie Bridges was in any way a failure, nor was um, in fact, it's much more of a success than people are, will, are willing to understand. Because if you go by the uh, GRY youth development zones, the zones that are identified are identified based on the crime statistics. And there's a reason why only a precious few of the LA Bridges sites are in those areas. And I think it's very important to recognize that that is probably the most positive indictment of what we've been doing the last 11 years is that we didn't qualify because we have been doing our work. And I would hope that this committee, in that there are funds identified for those uh, areas that are not in a uh, GRYD or gang reduction zone, that those funds be directed toward the bridges sites that are not included in the zones so that the ground that we have gained in the 11, last 11 years will not be lost. Thank you. Thank you. Ida Serda. Yes, um, thank you for having, uh, my name is Ayuda Sarada, I am at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. We've been part of the LA Bridges Run contract since also its inception in 97. We did the program at two middle schools, at Bancroft and Lecomte Middle School. So thank you for the opportunity to make public comment. Um, I, I think all my colleagues, I've been in this program for only five years, but I've been in the field of public health for 21 years, and I've never been part of a partnership that I have been in the last five years with these incredible colleagues I've had with this contract. A few things I just want to say is, one is I am disappointed as a lead agency that the mayor's office is not here. I think this is another example from my end of um, the kind of disconnect we've had with this program, but also just the representation in this transition. So I'm a little disappointed about that. But also, I, I do run a family development network program and um, at the division. And one of the concerns I've consistently had is already expressed by some like Brenda and, and Bobby and so forth is that the FDM program that I run is clearly not prepared to handle some of the cases that the city is acknowledging that some of these youth be referred to. Um, we are, they are not trained in gang prevention to work with high-risk youth. So we do have a consistent concern about how we're going to transition these families. Um, and Mr. Reyes, you've, Council Member Reyes, you've talked about getting to the heart of the... Cardenas. Cardenas, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that you've talked about getting to the heart of the issue, and we are dealing... That's a terrible mistake to do, isn't it, in front of this whole group? <laughs> All right. Because <laughs> I think you've been actually one of the most outspoken council members <laughs> on these issues. Um, it probably kind of explains my little bit of nervousness, which I tend to talk fast. But you should hear my Spanish. <laughs> but with that said, is that, um, um, where was I? The FDNs. FDN. You were talking about FDNs? Yes, with the FDN. So I get, and you talked about the heart of the issue before that sometimes you can't express, you know, the work we've okay. done. And right now we are dealing with an incredible families and youth who are feeling very abandoned. And it's very difficult to be placed as a lead agency in a position when we are not, um, after the close of this project, um, of having to determine where to refer the, where to refer these families to. Um, and as Jose, Riz, uh, as Jose Perez also mentioned, one of our biggest concerns is um, 
the staffing component. Children's Hospital did apply for the gain reduction zone of the Cypress area. We actually were interviewed yesterday for that contract. We are also going to be applying for the non-gain reduction zone, um, along with a number of other previous LA Bridges Run contractors to uh, build a case for the Hollywood community because we've seen a number of alarming cases of young people being killed in that community in the last five months. Um, but with that, we have no guarantee of staffing. So again, while we are required to have a certain number of caseloads, for example, the 50 that, that are now going to be, be reduced to 25 for the next six months, we may not even have 25 cases because, we may, again, we may not have staff. And we are fully dependent on the grant funds to run that project. Mm -hmm. And my last comment also is just to also acknowledge that in the last five years I've been part of this contract that with the leadership of Zeta Davis in the last, um, the last year, I have never felt more of a partner with CDD than I had in the last year with that agency. So I just want to acknowledge Zeta for her incredible support um, of making sure she's just not a monitor, but she was really a partner in this project. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Bart Trevino. Hello, good morning, uh, Mr. Councilman, uh, Mr. Cardenas. I'm privileged to be here today, and um, I'm a resident of the San Fernando Valley, and all your efforts and everything you've done in our communities. I congratulate you on all those and I really appreciate that. Um, I've been a resident of San Fernando Valley for over 45 years. I work for an agency called New Directions for Youth. I'm the program manager for the Alley Bridges One program at Pacoima Middle School. We have been providing these services for over 11 years at that school and it has made a, this transition has made a definite um, impact on our families and the community um, in that surrounding area and it's been a very difficult challenge to try to really uh, transition and explain to these parents recently why LAB1 program is ending. But with that, our agency is uh, going to continue to collaborate and go with the flow as the mayor's office has uh, asked us to. Uh, we also have been provided with the GRIP program and uh, we are a proposer for that and we're hoping our future endeavors in that situation will help us to continue to work with the community in the transition of these families. Um, one of my main concerns is, and I wanted the, the mayor's office hopefully to be here today, which is a disappointment, but at the same time, we're here to work with them, um, is the transition in, as far as the billing is concerned and everything and the staff that we are currently employed at with um, New Directions for Youth, and probably all the other agencies would agree, is that the billing process and the invoicing process would continue as it always has with CDD with one of the concerns being that there was always an opportunity for us to invoice for up, up startup funds for this for the program every fiscal year and at this point you know it's really a lack there's been a lack of um, attention to to those concerns because we have not been informed on what who did, how these are how we're going to process this who the contact people are at the mayor's office and what are we supposed to do and and, and the people that we're going to work with or who will be monitoring that that our particular um, uh, area that we service so um, with that we have I just hope that it's heard that we could, that those things would be a rush because as of July 1st what do we do there are staff that need to be paid there are, there are employees that that have families and they really need to know hey you know how we how are we going to be compensated for for the services that we have to continue for the next six months especially the month of July because because as we all know invoice processing does take time but at the same time, you know, if, when we have the appropriate contacts and the people that we know that we can contact through the mayor's office, then it makes that process a lot easier and staff, you know, are guaranteed that here, you know, you will be paid on this date as, as scheduled. So that was one of our concerns and um, just the whole transition process and support from the mayor's office that um, it's sort of, there's sort of been a, a negligence in that area. So we, we're, we want to know just for your support in that area to, and to voice that, those concerns as far as on our behalf and, and I'm, I'm sure with everyone else. And again, um, it's, it's, it's been a privilege to work with all these collaboratives. I've been doing this program for the last seven years at New Directions for Youth and the people that I've been working with, I feel are very compassionate. You talked about heart. I see a lot of heart in the room today and this is why we can make an impact. 
I myself am a product of those youth that are today and have made, made something of myself. So I'm grateful for programs like New Directions for Youth and all the other co collaboratives that continue, no matter what the situation or the city's decisions, to service the community and to work hard to make those changes that have to, that have to be changed every year from, from here and who knows when. We're really going to stop all this, all this stuff with gang members and all that, but that we are really going to uh, work together no matter what the funding are. And, and we can stick together as a collaborative to make impact in this city. So I thank you for your time. And okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Bill Martinez. Yes, Bill. Go ahead. Bill Martinez. I'm still director of the Unity Collaborative. And uh, I just wanted to touch uh, briefly on the whole transition process. And, and the, the biggest concerns I have are about the not so much the work with CDD. I think that's going to get worked out. But the nature of the transition and the fact that so much of our city is going to left unsupported by gang intervention following December 30th. The uh, structure that's been put out uh, in regards to the new program, while it works in terms of the individualized services, uh, both in prevention and intervention, uh, it doesn't necessarily fit well, or I don't think at all, with the hardcore intervention, which is much more of a regional need. Uh, so that so much of our city is going to be left uncovered. Uh, there is an option being proposed that allows those areas that are not covered to propose on certain uh, other funds. But again, those funds and the design of how they can be accessed are going to be very limited in scope. Uh, to give you an example, in the Harbor area where Tobin Settlement House has been working on a truce for the last 15 years, um, they may be able to go out their funds and might get funded for uh, San Pedro, but won't be able to, or that leaves open the, op the potential that uh, Wilmington, Harbor Gateway, or other areas would continue to go unfunded after that date. So I, I'm concerned about that particular process of the nature of the transition. Uh, the number of our neighborhoods are going to be left vulnerable, particularly for the work, as, as uh, Ms. Shockley said earlier, uh, the effects, uh, I think, have been proven in that some of the areas that were selected for zones uh, were not the areas where we're working. So uh, we're kind of working against ourselves in many respects, that the work, the effort that's been put in by the intervention community uh, is, is now been said, thanks, we'll see you later, unless you happen to be in those areas where the work is just overwhelming. Uh, so I'm, I'm concerned about that and hoping that at least that part of the intervention proposal is still to debate. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next, Dan Mohammed. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stan Muhammad. I'm with Venice 2000 and Helper Alliance. And I'm hearing a lot of the same um, comments. One of the greatest fears uh, that we're facing in the 11th District in particular, where we primarily do a lot of the intervention services, is that is not a GRZ. Uh, even though we have other linkages to the city and we have other people working in other parts of the city, but the 11th district is not a game reduction zone. And I think the mayor overlooked what has happened there. Uh, currently, we have in place agreements between the black and Latino gangs in that area. One of the greatest fears after December is what is the possibility of those agreements breaking down because we don't have our hardcore gang intervention staff in place to make sure that the communication is in place. So. I'm just hoping that that 900,000 can be an increase there for the areas that's not GRZs. And I'm hoping that the city council can really use everything within your power to get the mayor to realize that just because we have the GRZs in place, it's almost to me like the gang injunction, where if you suppress a certain area, if an individual still want to be a gang member, he's going to move his operation to another location. And we have right now ceasefires in place in San Pedro and also in Venice. And who's to say that these individuals would just relocate from the areas that's being heavily suppressed, even though they're saying it's going to be gang intervention in the GRZs. But I still haven't heard anyone tell us what role will Homeland Security play, 
I haven't I haven't heard anyone tell us what role the the, uh, the clear is going to play when it comes to intervention. And to this day, we don't know. We don't know if they're going to be profiling individuals. We don't know if they're going to say, okay, now that we've identified who's the main players, let's put a gang injunction in this area and let's heavily suppress these individuals. So we don't know. But I'm just hoping that outside of the zones that the city council can put a lot of pressure on the mayor and say, look, we need to increase that 900000 bucks. And thank you, Tony, for your thank you. support. Thank uh, you. To your question about what role is CLEAR or Homeland Security going to play on intervention, yeah. I hope zero. Intervention is not suppression. And CLEAR and Homeland Security seem to enjoy the idea that they are suppression oriented. So yeah. I, I don't anticipate CLEAR or uh, Homeland Security playing a role on intervention. Uh, they uh, very proudly think of themselves as suppression uh, elements. And uh, whether I like it or not, they can remain that way. But I'm here to address intervention and prevention. And I don't foresee any role that Homeland Security or uh, CLEAR will have an intervention. Thank you. Okay, thank you. They will coexist, but that is not their purview. Um, one, one question, uh, clarifying question from CDD, please. Um, <clears throat> um, what's the eligibility criteria for agencies that are eligible to receive payment uh, uh, advancements or month to month? The eligibility criteria for advance payment. Can we get her? Yeah, and our, our fiscal person will respond. Okay. My name is Maya Bellet. I'm the chief accountant for CDD. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, uh, the practice is that we required a form, which is called special bank agreement, for an agency to receive advance. But we have decided that for this transition, we're prepared to. Uh, provide one month advance to all the agencies, at least for one month. And then on the second month, they'll go back to the normal process of reporting and invoicing and, and, um, and submission of cash requests. Uh, uh, the agencies also are going to use uh, or utilize the, uh, the old forms. The only change that we made is the name of the, uh, uh, the invoice, uh, the label which is going to be labeled as mayor's office. That's the only change that we made. But everything will remain the same. So these organizations have a familiarity with the forms and the process. They're and familiar with right it. Right now, yes. that process anticipates it will remain the same. That's correct. Okay. My form might look a little different, but in substance, it's the same form. That's correct. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, <clears throat> There are no more public comment cards on item number two to this committee. Public comment is currently open on item number two. Is anybody here to make additional comment on item number two? Okay. Uh, seeing, yes. Your name again? Jose Esqueda from ADAP. Um, I'm glad to hear that the process will remain the same um, as far as payment and the cost reimbursement on a month to month basis. Um, just from personal experience working with the mayor's office and having contracts uh, with them. We usually don't get paid for six months to 12 months, so I'm glad to hear that the month to month will happen. Okay. So thank, thank you. Thank you for letting us know how it happens on the street. Um, <clears throat> so with that, uh, public comment will now close on item number two. Um, uh, what this committee is going to request that the mayor's office uh, add to this uh, comment on this item as we will rehear this item next week in this committee and that the mayor's office report uh, relative to how the closeout requirements identified by CDD will be addressed by the mayor's office and uh, when programs are and when and how the programs will be transferred so that we can hear their interpretation not only CDD's interpretation. In addition to that um, I'm going to ask of the CLA's office that uh, a copy of the current lease agreements and updated equipment and subcontracts and other related agreements be forwarded to this committee so we, we're apprised of what, what, what they are. I'm sorry, CDD. Uh, uh, forward that to the CLA so that they could um, um, look over those documents and then apprise this uh, committee of them. Um, 
Also, um, we need uh, to have an idea of what kind of uh, surplus property may be resulting in this whole process or any of those uh, uh, matters when it comes to property and what we intend to do uh, in this transition with, with those items and with, with that surplus property. Okay. Um, with that, again, we'll put this item over to be heard in this committee uh, in the coming week as we will have a, on a, this committee will be agendized again next week. That concludes the items on the agenda uh, for this committee. It is now, this committee is now open for general public comment. Is anybody here for general public comment? That's comment on issues that are not related to items on the agenda. Seeing and hearing none, general public comment is now closed. And with that, this committee is now adjourned. <laughs>